to Psalm 50, please. Psalm 50. The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He'll call to the heavens from above to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge of the Selah. Hear all my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. Will not take a bull from your house, nor goats of your fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. And I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving, and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes, or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him, and have been a protector with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against you your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you've done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers, sac offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the day in which you blessed us with. Thank you, Father, for the moisture you chose to give us again. Father, we thank you so much for blessing us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places when we're in Christ. Father, we thank you for so many blessings and so many prayers that have been answered in the positive. And Father, for those that are still suffering and struggling, we pray for their strength. Pray for comfort. Pray for guidance. We just thank you, Father, for the privilege we have of being in this country to do it, to get to worship you freely, and to do as you want. Please forgive us of our sins. Please bless us tonight. We pray for Barbara and Patrick as they're struggling with their health. We pray for Vern as he's struggling with his health. And we pray for Lanny as he's sick. We pray that everything will get better with him. Father, please forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. 173.
Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your place. Restore my soul, renew my courage, Lord, it needs restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fears with faith so bold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Would you 
please mark 744? 744. We will use that as a means of encouragement tonight. When someone asks me, when they become a Christian, or someone asks me if they were starting a new habit, that is reading their Bible, what would I suggest, what book would they suggest, or what would I suggest to start with? For me personally, I just read about four chapters a day in the Old Testament, and I'm reading one chapter a week in the New Testament. Usually I'm done pretty early or pretty ahead because sometimes I get so wrapped up in what I read, I forget that I've already gone beyond four chapters, which is okay. But if you just wanted a book, if you just wanted to start with a book and, and just kind of graduate up or gradually get up, it would have to be the book of Mark. Mark is a short gospel. It's the shortest, the shortest of the four gospels because of the audience to whom he writes. He is writing to the Greeks. He's writing to Gentile people. He's not writing to Jewish people who need to know that Jesus fulfilled every prophecy made of him. They don't need to know the lengthy discussions of, of medical things like the Romans did, nor do they, nor would they ever appreciate the words of John, which was written about 20 years after the first three Gospels. We call Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels. And you open that up, and the very first thing you read out of Mark is the, the fact of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. And it's, it's kind of a, what I call a, a real fast roller coaster here of, of, of activities. You get to Mark chapter 5, which is where we're going to spend our time tonight. You get to Mark chapter 5, and I can only imagine, I can only imagine what this scene must have looked like. That there were people who literally would not go where that man would go. The reason they wouldn't go is because they try to chain him up, he'd bust the chains. He scared people to death. I, I, I'm, this is going to sound cruel, but I can only imagine if they said, if they practiced Halloween like we do, I can only imagine what, what these kids were doing when they'd go up to where he was. But it was a horrible, horrible place. An awful, awful place. So the verse 2, Jesus, when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because the chains he had, he had often been bound with, he broke them. He pulled them apart, and the shackles broke into pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. I can, it's just, when I picture this, I just, I feel so bad for the guy in the first place, and in the second place, can you imagine what this would have looked like on television today? Continue with me, verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried with a loud voice, said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And he asked him, What's your name? And he answered, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. And with a large herd of swine were feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. All at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and those and they told it in the city and in the country, and there he went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine 
Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not forbid him, but said, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done, and all marveled. What do we learn from this? Number one, demons know Jesus. This is what was so mind-boggling to me when I keep reading, when I was reading again about the crucifixion and the trials of Jesus, how they did not know who he was. But the demons knew who he was. In fact, when this man saw Jesus from afar, not close, but from afar, Mark says he came and worshipped him. When he worshipped him, the legion, and by the way, legion was usually 6,000. you imagine being possessed by 6,000 demons? Uh, and and here, here they are, and they are begging him, begging him not to torment them. Well, what do we learn from Mark 1, 23 and 24? Just four chapters before, there's a man in their synagogue. He's got an unclean spirit, and he's crying out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And yet, you got 12 <coughs> disciples who hung around with Jesus all the time. You've got the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests, and the and the council who say this man is not Jesus the Son of God. Well, you can continue in Acts 19, 11 through 16, when the girl who's got this possession, she she's possessed by a demon. And as they're going through, as Paul and Barnabas are going through Ephesus and going through that area, the, the, these men seized this opportunity, seized this girl, and they were making good profit off her. And when that demon saw Paul, he turned around and said, oh, let me, let me back up. The, the one I'm talking about is, is a little bit different. I'm talking about the seven sons of Siva, and I apologize. And, and, and they, have the, they have this possession. And all of a sudden, the man, the man, or, or the man says, uh, or they try to, they try to correct him, and the demon says, "Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you?" And that demon started possessing them because they weren't doing anything God said to do. Now, the one I was referring to, and let me try to clean that up a little bit. There was a girl who was who had a demon possession. And in Acts 16, and she's going around and she's following Paul and she's following Paul and Barnabas. And, and, and she just keeps on being aggravated and aggravated. And finally Paul said, I, I implore you by the name of the Lord, come out of her. And she couldn't do the miraculous things. And the men that were making money off her saw it, so they just threw her to the side. But they know Jesus. They know who he is. And I just can't help but feel sorry for this guy in verses 1 to 5. Yet I feel sorry for people sometimes. I just picked up a man last night. In his mid-30s, he hung himself. To listen to that family, to listen to the songs, and listen to the to the what could we have done to stop this? What I said, I've been there. They said, how have you been there? I said, I went and picked up a good friend of mine. He was seen by five doctors at Red River Hospital in Wichita Falls, Texas. And the next morning, he, went, he spent the night. We got him home. We got him home about 4 o'clock. I always told him my corny jokes. He always would say the same thing. Yep, that about do it. Went to college. To do my classes, and when I got home, the police were up at, at their house and some other people, and I went, What's going on? 
one friend of mine said, he killed himself. He took his little 22 Derringer pistol and put it in his head right here. I can still see where the hole was that they tried to cover up. And the damage that he did, oh, he, he didn't do, do all the damage to himself that he did to his mother and to people that knew him. So those five doctors who spent about six weeks trying to figure out what they could have done differently and the damage he eventually done, I told my wife, I said, if he could see what was going on right now, he'd have never done that. He'd have never done that. But a lot of people are lost. They're not demon-possessed. That's not what I said, and that's not what we're going to ever say. I know you've seen movies that promote it, but no such thing. I do know that I think sometimes some school kids are, but okay, sometimes my kids were, but that's just temporary. But here is the demons, and they know Jesus. And it's sad that many people know Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. What I mean by that? Well, they know who Jesus is. They know he's the guy that in about six weeks everybody's going to celebrate. But do they know Jesus? And the answer is no. Number two, Jesus commands the demons. Matthew, back in Matthew chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. They can't quite prove it, but scientists think now that when a cat lays on your chest, you think that when they're bumping your head and they're trying to make sure that you're they that you know they're a part of your family, the new research indicates that a, that a cat can figure out something wrong with you. And just like a chihuahua, a dog, they will take that sickness upon themselves. And they will all of a sudden be shaking and they will be doing things, and then a cat, cat on the other hand, they, they'll put up with the sickness. When I read that, I jokingly said, well, I must have been sick a lot, and then come to find out, yeah, Dr. Shrigley was right. He said, when I was born, I was going to be a sickly child. But just the, that very idea that an animal would do that reminds you of what Paul would say in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. What does verse 8 say? But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In Luke chapter 11, go with me to Luke chapter 11, please. Verses 14 to 23. Luke, the 11th chapter. Verse number 14. And he was casting out a demon... And it was mute, that is, couldn't talk. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Verse 16. Others testing him saw him, saw from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, verse 17, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed 
guard full with a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overtakes him and kills him, I'm sorry, let me read that again. But when a stranger that then stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Now, Beelzebub was believed to be the son or the grandson of the devil. I don't know who started that, that but there wasn't any truth in it. But people would always accuse Jesus of not being who he said he was. To explain away the power of Jesus, to explain away what Jesus was trying to do, they would always say he belongs to the devil. And Jesus would say things like, I am, John 8, 58. He'd say things like John 11, 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. And they'd go, wait a minute, back in John 8, for example, when he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, they said, how in the world can Abraham rejoice to see your day? You're not yet 50 years old. That's when he said in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. He called himself God. Who was he? Who is he? God. And the thing that is so hard for people to believe, but it's true, is that Jesus was once the Savior, and one day, he's still the Savior now, if you want to, if you want to obey him. But he's going to be the judge. How do I know that? Acts 17, 30 and 31. Because he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Because there is a day of righteousness, day of judgment coming. In which he, God through his son Jesus, will be the judge. He's given assurances by raising him from the dead. And when he commanded these demons. This is not like the movie The Exorcist. First time I saw that, I went, that is not even true. I'm, I'm saying this respectfully. But if you ever have seen The Exorcist, you know what I'm talking about. He, he, the, the one priest goes in and he starts, I, I implore you, and, and one time she takes and turns her head in a complete 360 and she's throwing up another time and then I won't tell you something else she does that my friends always wanted me to know and I didn't want to know? Because the Bible says in James chapter 5, James chapter 4, about verse 3 and 4, you resist the devil and he'll do what? He'll run from you. He will be just like those two dogs that got in a fight uptown in my hometown when the pharmacist went and took a five-gallon bucket of water water and dumped it on them and they ran away from each other thinking the other one got beat and you could hear him yelping all the way home. That's the devil. He's going to run. He's going to flee. All we have to do is tell him no. Paul said it another way, resist him steadfast in the faith. And Jesus didn't have to go through and when, when he commanded this guy, he said come out of the unman, come out of the man unclean spirit. But there's something he does that's real strange here. We'll go back to Mark 5, verse number 9. How or what is your name? And by, the way, by the way, a movie used that. I was smiling about it. And everybody else said, where do you get that? And I said, well, you got it from Mark 5. What is your name? And they, and he said... Verse 9, my name is Legion, for we are many. No one could find him. No one could put clothes on him. No one could do anything to him, but what is he doing? He's coming to worship God. And when he does what he's commanded to do, the man is healed. Look at this. Verse number 16. I'm sorry, 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting 
and clothed and in his right mind. And you'd have thought, man, that's the best time to have a conversation. You'd have thought that would have been the best time to, to wow. But because they've been afraid of him for so long, guess what happened? They kept that fear. They were afraid. And when this man did what he was supposed to do, he got healed. You remember Matthew chapter 8, the first 14 verses? Tying in with Matthew 9, 18 to 34, same principle here. Not, it's a different story. But you remember the woman who had the flow of blood for 12 years? She wasn't getting any better. Mark said doctors made it worse. He's going to Jairus' house to heal Jairus' daughter. But this woman who had this flow of blood, who wasn't even supposed to be a part of the assembly, she's supposed to be outside because blood was a, a, a naughty thing. She says, I don't have a choice. I've got to just touch the hem of his clothes, the hem of his garment. And I love Jesus. I love Jesus for a lot of reasons, but this is one of my favorites. Whenever she touches him, her flow of blood stopped. Jesus sensed the power go out of him. And when he turns around and he says to his 12 disciples who touched me, they go, and I'm going to paraphrase, but this is what they mean. Are you nuts? Have you lost your mind? Do you not see the obvious in front of you? Look how many people are here. Look how many people are here. The multitudes here, and you have the audacity to ask the question, who touched me? And Jesus said, you missed the question. He didn't say it in those words, but that's what he meant. He didn't say who touched me. He said, who touched? When she saw that she couldn't get away with what she had done, she told Jesus, it was I, like he didn't already know. And what does he say? Daughter, go. Go in good cheer. Your face made you well. Now, while that takes place, the people who are taking care of Jairus' daughter until he gets back turns and says, don't bother the master anymore, the teacher. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's dead. You can imagine what Jairus must have been feeling like. If he hadn't waited just those few seconds or waited those couple of minutes to heal that woman, I don't mean to sound selfish, Sure. But you know what? If he just if he just went, he'd have been all right. We'd have been okay. And how do I know that? That's inferred in the text because the mourners that they had hired, believe it or not, they hired mourners, were standing there when Jesus said, Your daughter's not dead, she's sleeping. And their laughter turned to humor. Their laughter or their their crying turned to laughter, and they laughed him to scorn. And he took Peter, James, and John, and the parents in with him, and he said just four simple words: "Talitha kumi," which is to say, "Little girl, arise." So I was going to put it together in six words: three in English, three in Greek. And he took her by the hand, and she sat up, and she got up, and she wasn't sick, and she was, and she got up. In fact, Jesus said, "Give her something to eat." That baffled me for years and years and years. Why would he say, "Give her something to eat"? Because what he knows is somebody will say, "This is all a magician's trick. This is an illusion." But if she goes and eats, 
then what? She is healed. By the way, the first uh, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 14, you've got stories like Peter healing, or Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law, uh, uh, mother-in-law, and I always laugh about that because most sons-in-law do not get along with their mother-in-law. I got along with mine. In fact, my wife said, I think you, you got along better than we did, but uh, my mother-in-law was great. But you have Jesus healing these people. And when the stories would go out about Jesus healing people, all they had to do was get close enough to him. And what did he do? All he did was heal. But look what happens. This breaks my heart when I read this story every time. You see, John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 tells us about these people. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive them, he gave them the right to become sons of God. Here he comes, he empties himself of the privileges of heaven, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 12. And what happens? He gets rejected. Go back to Mark chapter 5, verse number 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been, who had the legion, or who had been demon possessed and had the legion, sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon possessed, and about the swine. Wow, those approximate two thousand swine that went down the hill. Why Jesus did that? Completely, I can't tell you. I tend to think, like most people, well, swine was an unclean animal anyway, and they weren't supposed to be hanging around unclean animals anyway, so Jesus took care of that. I don't know that that's completely the truth. The thought. But the real issue was, who's in charge? Who's the commander-in-chief? Who had the authority to tell these demons what to do. We do. Jesus told them, and Jesus through us tells them. In Acts 4.11, Peter says, don't make the mistake of rejecting the Messiah. Because there is no other name under heaven, in verse 12, given among men, by which we must be saved. I said a few years ago, and I repeat it from time to time, I thought what I was going to do is get a degree in psychology and figure out why people behave the way they do. I got a degree in psychology, and like Michael Brashear said the other night, about the time I think I have everybody figured out, somebody goes and rewrites the playbook. And that's about right. <laughs> I have learned more about psychology by studying the Word of God than I have any other book. What caused them to reject him? What caused them to tell him, go away? Fear. Being afraid. And so it is that when he got in the boat, what does the man do? First of all, he obeys everything he's told to do. What he wants to to do is he wants to go with Jesus. And what he wants to do is he wants to tell everybody everywhere he went what happened to him. Jesus says, don't go home. But what you do is, when you go to your friends, then you tell them the great things that has been done for you. He went to what's called Decapolis. It is a region of ten cities. And he told them what happened to him. But the best part of this as to what he does is he sits. Can you imagine? These people have known him all their lives or most of their lives as living in the tombs. Can't 
but can't keep him chained down, can't keep him closed, so you know what people were saying. You don't go that way. And he's in their midst in his right mind, and he's sitting there fully clothed. But you see, he's healed. He's healed because he worshiped. He worshiped. He tried to follow his way. But Jesus wouldn't have any part of that. Because Jesus said, that's not going to do any good for you to go with me to tell people. But it will do a great world of good to the kingdom if you'll go tell your friends. That's what we're told to do today, is it not? Go tell your friends what the Lord has done for you. It's called the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Mark 16, 15, and 16. And he simply did what Jesus said to do. Verse 20. He departed and to proclaim in the capitals all that Jesus had done for him. And all marveled. You don't read of one person that didn't marvel at this whole situation. They all marveled. Well, I'm like the old songwriter. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. How he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. Is my song and shall be. Oh, how wonderful. Is my Savior who loves me. What are you going to do with Jesus? You see, there's two questions, there's two choices here. Real simple. But it's pretty serious. John 12, 48, we read of people who reject him. And Jesus said, he who rejects me and my word will have him who judges him at the last day. Jesus said, you're looking at the person that's going to be the judge. And it's going to be based on whether or not you reject him or accept him. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, but he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. He learned things by the things he suffered. But having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to those who love him. This evening we're going to sing 744. I invite you to open your books to that. If there is something we can do for you tonight spiritual walk with the Lord, we would love to do it as we sing. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high, someday your record you'll see, someday you'll answer the question of life, what will your answer be, what will it be, what will it be, where will you spend your eternity, what will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knee. Facing the sentence of life or of death. What will that sentence be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Time to prepare, my friend, to make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified one, he will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be?
690. We'll sing the first and last stanza of this song and be dismissed in prayer. 690. There's a land beyond the river that we call the sweet forever. And we only reach that shore by face decree. beyond the shining river when they ring those golden bells for you and me when our days shall know their number when in death we sweetly slumber when the king commands the spirit to be free never more with anguish laid on we shall reach that lovely Aden when they Don't you hear the bells are ringing? Don't you hear the angels singing? Tis the glory, hallelujah, jubilee. In that far off sweet forever, just beyond the shining river, when they ring those golden bells for you and me. Our Father, we thank you for day in which you blessed us with. Father, we thank you so much for the ability and the help and the encouragement we have today and we've gained from being together. I appreciate everybody who's here and I appreciate your presence tonight, Father, and I pray that we've done everything in accordance with your will. Father, thank you so much for the many wonderful blessings. Thank you for the temporary blessings of life. Thank you for the, for the spiritual blessings which we have. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Keep us safe in your care tonight. We pray again you'll always be with us. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here.